There we go. Oh. Let's hey, go. we're live. <laughs> All right, well, welcome. So we had uh, mentioned that we were going to uh, do uh, kind of a podcast, more than just a little blog, but a podcast, so a little, little longer. Um, and this is all in preparation of the story, which starts this coming Sunday. Um, so we're, we're excited. And, and I say it starts this coming Sunday. I'm going to go into a little bit of a, what a schedule could look like sure. um, for the average person out there. But, uh, but every Thursday, uh, Pastor Dan and I are hoping to uh, be here with you on Facebook around this time after lunch um, to kind of go in depth for the chapter that we will discuss the coming Sunday. Yeah, so, for the whole section of scripture that's being covered. Correct. So so in the story, if you have that, um, we uh, uh, bought 200 copies of it. And believe it or not, we got rid of 200 copies. It's pretty impressive. That was one of the things that excited me the most right away. It was to see, yeah, people are excited if they're buying them all up. I've had emails, phone calls, people stop by the office talking about how excited they are to go through this and so how this they've already good. started reading ahead. And that's okay if you have... Um, <laughs> slow down a little bit so you can kind of work with us through this, but uh, or at least keep coming back. <laughs> that's <section>. right. <laughs> um, but uh, we're gonna we ordered more copies. I hope they're gonna be in tomorrow, but I, I'm kind of nervous that they're probably not gonna be. Okay. So we're trying. Um, if you didn't get a copy, just bear with us. It may just be one week behind. Well, and, and I mean you can always just say I'm going to read Genesis one through eleven this week. I mean it's not so yeah, many pages absolutely. in your Bible that you absolutely. can't do that either because the story is largely the scripture right there for you. So Okay, so if you're wondering what we're talking about, let me just spend just okay, a little yeah, bit of time explaining yeah. what this is. The story is not a Bible. It's an abridged version of the Bible, meaning they have um, tried to write it in the same manner that uh, we today would sit down and read a book. Um, so I know the, the Bible is in chapters and so forth, but it kind of put it in more of um, story chapters, how mm -hmm. we normally would understand a typical book storybook that we would read. Um, so in doing that, they try to keep a, a flow of narrative that starts in Genesis, goes all the way to uh, Revelation, and just mm -hmm. kind of speaks the narrative of how God uh, laid out his salvation for the world, for, mm -hmm. for you and for us, and um, and put it in a, a narrative that we would normally sit down and read. Yeah. Um, so they, they did take some liberties, and we'll get into some of that here in a little bit, but of, of pulling some parts out, some chapters out, so they didn't try to just rewrite the Bible and switch mm -hmm. it around. Um, but they put it in chronological order and, and took out parts that maybe break up the flow of the story right. a little bit. So it's, a, it's not to replace the Bible, but it will help understand, I would say, the big picture of the Bible. And that's what I like about it. It puts everything in order with that theme running all the way throughout it. Yeah. yeah. So I'd hope we're going to go over this for the next uh, 31, 32 weeks. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to really spend some time, actually longer than that. But because we'll have Advent in there we'll too. We'll have some, yes. some breaks in there. But... Uh, um, so you'll, uh, if you want to look, um, we're going to ask Laura to maybe put um, on the Facebook page a, a schedule timeline of what this looks like, uh, as well as uh, some other information as we go through this. Um, so that's what it is. Um, did you read chapter one? Absolutely. Read okay. Chapter one. So I read it as well. I've read well. it a couple times now. Oh, you did better than I did. I read it once. <laughs> um, so what did you think? So, I mean, I really liked uh, the way it approaches things. So essentially we get the story of creation. We get the story of Adam and Eve and the fall. A little bit of Cain and Abel and then it jumps to the story of the flood. And so I think that, that starts things out real nicely. And the, the little sections that connect things, um, I like because not only does it tell you kind of a little bit of what you missed, but it really does a good job of highlighting the themes. So God is a, a caring one. Yes. You're talking like the uh, italicized Yeah, the italicized sections. paragraphs which say, okay, now we're jumping from one section of Scripture as it is written to the next section of Scripture as it is written. I was wondering how they were going to kind of tie two ends of two different stories together. And mm -hmm. it they really does a nice job of transitioning from yeah, one absolutely. section to the next. And yep. um, the, what's in italis, italics in, in the book... Um, that's not from the Bible. Everything mm -hmm. else is from the Bible, taken from the NIV version of the Bible. And right. so um, a lot of it you'll read and you'll say, I feel like I'm just reading the Bible. Well, mm -hmm. it's because you are in, in a way. Um, but uh, there are parts that are, were not there as well. But so it covered everything from uh, Adam and Eve and, and all creation mm -hmm. to... 
Um, it, it touched on Cain and Abel and mm -hmm. went to Noah and the flood. It, it did a good job of really going through that. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, it went to... Uh, uh, it touches on what's going to come after come the it, flood and right up to it just begin starting to talk about Abram. Getting into Abram. Yep. And, and it kind of lays out what I think we're going to see here is uh, uh, how God starts to now rebuild and bring leaders into mm -hmm. uh, his people. So... Um, before we get too much into it, let me just go through a couple things. We have our beer, by the way. This is many thanks to Ron Kinley, who yep. gave us this. I don't know if you can see this. I'll hold it up. It's Luther beer. It's it says Mar Grazia on it's, it. It's uh, Sola Grazia beer. That means grace alone. Made by a company called Save the World Brewing Company. I mean, yep. you don't get better than that, right? It is. So they have... Uh, I've looked them up actually, and they make different beers for different church fathers and Martin Luther. Oh, do they really yeah, have so a lot you, of different church you fathers? A, you can get a whole bunch of so them. You can so. get a Calvin one. You can get a. I don't know if Calvin. Saint Augustine. Right. You can get a. I'll have to look again. All right, all right. All right. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> but they do have uh, a bunch of them. Um, somebody asked me once, "Why do you have beer at these things?" And <laughs> I don't have a real good answer other than this: when we were at seminary. Every Thursday, they had something that we called Proffenstein, <laughs> okay? And they had a keg of beer that they would roll out into the student center, for lack of a better mm -hmm. yeah. name. But um, And the professors, our seminary professors, along with the students, would all sit down over a glass of beer, and we would just talk theology. Um, we would. It was a, a neat opportunity to engage with our professors in a, a more informal way. It... it uh, um, it just brought the formality of the relationship mm -hmm. down a little bit, and it was able to talk to them about faith, about life. It wasn't always theology. Sometimes it was just about the struggles of just actual life, of following living Jesus. a life, yeah. following Jesus. And yeah. so they were real special times. I I never missed one. Um, I remember my fourth year, and when Catherine was a baby, I would drag Catherine <laughs> in her baby stroller thing, and we would go to. Proffenstein and I would sit there and talk with professors and I'll promise you this I was not the only dad there with a baby yep. drinking beer talking theology learning about life how the to babies be a dad. weren't drinking beer just to be clear that is true <laughs> um, that is true um, but anyways uh, so long story short um, we hope that this kind of we want this to be a conversation yeah and, and that's the idea I mean you think you know, what do people do? I mean, to, to build relationships. We sit around a table and we eat together. We drink together. Those are the kinds of things yeah. that kind of lower the, maybe, the, I don't know if the anxiety level or the formality level the certainly formality, decreases yeah. when we have food, when we have drinks. And so this is just a way of us saying, um, this is not meant to be us, bequeathing you with our knowledge, but, <laughs> right. but, but having a conversation. Um, and so it's us having a conversation with each other and it decreases our level of formality when we're sitting here and drinking a beer with each other. But then hopefully you kind of get in on that a little bit too. And so it's it's almost our way. Maybe we should have a third beer here, just sitting empty at the table to represent all oh, those. Yeah, that's yours. Um, <laughs> so one more, just a couple things before we dive into the conversation. How to use this podcast. Mm, yeah. Um, I hope that uh, this is something that you listen to um, and, and it's... I'll tell you, like, for for instance, my sister will listen to Christian podcasts while she's cleaning the house. She'll mm -hmm. put, her, put her phone somewhere central. She can put her earbuds in, and then she'll clean the house. And it'll yep. be just something that she can have and, and listen to. Um, if you want to, you know, at night, if you have a habit of, of watching TV, if you feel like you need to see something, broadcast it to your TV and or just watch it. If you you know if you, you could try, listen to it while you're working you know, out, a lot of people do podcasts while you're working, you're working out, out so, so that'd be great. So find some time that you can kind of set aside. It doesn't have to be such a devotional moment, but mm -hmm. make it work for you. Yeah. I think that the information we provide here will be good. What we've hoped to do um, with the story is to create a a a schedule opportunity. So for the person who is all in, mm -hmm. so let's say you're all in. You're like, I'm excited about this. Stuff. I've got my copy at home. I got my copy at home. I'm all in. I am doing this. And by the end of this time, as we go through this, I am going to know the scriptures better and the story of mm -hmm. God's salvation better. Here's kind of the best way I could say that we've tried to design this for you. And I think this is important. On Wednesday, Laura is going to send out to everyone uh, that we have an email for. And if we don't have your email, please let us know what it is. 
Um, Laura's email is ltrulock at hopelubbock.com. So L-T-R-U-E-L-O-C-K at hopelubbock.com. You can send her an email saying, hey, could you put me on this email list? But mm -hmm. she'll email this piece of paper right here. We will also give that out on Sundays as well. But that'll be kind of your cue of, okay, it's time to read the chapter. So mm -hmm. let's say that comes out on Wednesday. You now have that paper either in your hand from the previous Sunday or you get it in your email Wednesday. Now you're going to read the chapter. It took me 10 minutes yeah. to read through it. No. It was 12 pages, short, easy mm -hmm. read. Um, after you read that on Thursday, you can listen to this podcast. Mm -hmm. In this paper are also some just things to help you as you read along, questions to ask, things to ponder, reflections, and so forth. On Sunday morning, you go to church. The sermon will be over the story in the chapter. Sunday, um, school, Sunday will school will be over it as well. Um, children will receive... You got one of those. Oh, it's underneath there. there. Is that one? Yeah. yeah. So the children, each age group of child okay, will yeah. receive... Take home, so you can do that with your kids. Read it with your kids. You will receive from Sunday school, you'll receive a packet like this as well that'll have our discussion for Sunday school, but more than we'll ever get through on a Sunday morning. But again, further reflection. And then on Monday and Tuesday, this will, you the encouragement would be to go back over this. Don't jump into the next chapter yet until you get that email on Wednesday from Laura. That'll be your cue. Time to start the next chapter and move to the next thing. That's for the person who's all in. So that's a lot of resources. Um, there's a lot there for you to, to use. But it's kind of like a holistic learning process then. So you start out by kind of digging in and meditating on the word yourself. And then maybe digging into kind of the details with us on, on our podcast, whether you listen to it Thursday or Friday or Saturday. Then Sunday is meant to actually be a little bit more meditative and reflective. Right. Um, not just trying to give you the data, but really some spiritual insights. What is this, you know, what is this big picture saying in terms of God's relationship with humanity? What is God saying to me as a person? What does it look like for me to apply uh, Genesis 1 through 11 to my actual life, right? right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you go out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a chance for you to do that in some community for you to you know whether you're go ahead and, and text or email with friends or whether your family's been doing it with you at the same time you can get together at the table and be like hey what did you guys learn about Sunday you know what what, did, what was your take on Adam and Eve what was your take on Cain and Abel what was your take on the story of Noah and the flood um, what did you guys talk about? what did you learn and then you can kind of share stuff back and forth with each other and it's also supposed to be about kind of putting it into practice like there's, there's a lot of things in the take home material action piece that's like okay go out in nature and you know go just sit and listen to nature for a little while and you know, ponder what it is that God created or, you know, I mean, little simple kid questions like what animal are you like, you know, or something like that. You know, that, that's kind of fun stuff. So, um, very good. So, so Sunday actually kind of marks the, the middle of the week, if you will. Yes. If you're going to follow and take it all in, Sunday would mark the middle of the week and, and in the end, use it how you want. Mm -hmm. If you want to read a chapter, go to church, read a chapter, go to church, man, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that Absolutely. as well. Um, but we want to be able to resource you for whatever level that you decide to dive into this. I think there's a level for you. And so mm -hmm. find find your routine. And, and again, I, I think hopefully these podcasts are fun. Yeah. So I want to spend some time. What was not in the story? What were some of the things? Because because That surprises you, doesn't it? You're like, wait a second. You're not going to talk <laughs> about what's in it first? No, we're going to go to the stuff they left yeah, out. Yeah, they between. left. they left some stuff out. Um, the first one that I noticed that they left out was they talked about Cain and Abel. They mentioned kind of the very bare bones of it, but they didn't go into the story of really Cain and Abel. They just kind of said... They just kind of have the beginning of it, basically, yeah. is what they hit. So, um, yep. so what, what happened? What was the rest of the story of Cain and Abel? So Cain, right, um, kills his brother Abel. And uh, we know it, it does tell why, because he offered a sacrifice that was more self-centered and not, therefore not pleasing to the Lord. The motivation was wrong. The heart yeah, was wrong. It definitely seems to go to, to inner motivation. I would agree with you. Um, yep. So then what happened? What, we don't really hear what happened to Cain. What was the result of that? What yeah, was exactly. the consequence of that? So, so God actually curses Cain, right? So, you know, I mean, you get this, this great interaction between God and, and Cain at the end where, 
you know, God asks, you know, Cain, where's Abel, you know, your brother, and am I not my brother's keeper? And God basically says, yes, yes, we are supposed to have a relationship with <laughs> you, each other. You are your brother's <laughs> keeper, yes. actually. What have you done? <laughs> the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, which is kind of one of those early places of, you know, association between uh, blood and evil, you know, that, that happens right away in the Bible. Um, and then, you know, continued cursing. So one of the biggest points that, that we get throughout all this section is that sin keeps growing and keeps getting worse. And so here we say the, the relationship between Cain and his brother is now cursed. But within yeah. a family, we see this tension. We see sin resulting and not just in a little bit of sibling rivalry, but so actual I, death. So whereas uh, the story didn't really go very uh, deep into... The story of Cain and Abel, it did capture that point. Mm -hmm. It did talk about how sin just kind of continued to grow. Yeah. Um, and in fact, as you read this, you kind of get a sense that it grew rapidly from the time of Adam and Eve through Cain and Abel all the way to Noah. And all of a sudden you get to Noah, right, which is already in chapter 5 mm -hmm. of the Bible. Um, you get to Noah and God's like, they're all bad, all yeah. except for one family. Yeah, Every absolutely. one of them is disobeyed and turned their back on me. And so this is one of those kind of interesting things that, that was only pointed out to me a few years ago. My parents went to um, the Creation Museum and saw the Ark. In Kentucky? In Kentucky. That one? They went there a few years ago. And they said one of the interesting points to them, and this maybe gets towards the Ark a little bit too, is that, that the, the people who built things said, you know, the technology that was used must have been very primitive, obviously, compared to what we have. But we always assume, like, okay, the individuals from this era in history were very primitive people. They may have had primitive tools, but they said, you know, they're probably incredibly, incredibly brilliant. And one of their theories, um, physically, mentally, and spiritually, is that because they were closer to creation and had less years of the fall, that they were actually better in some way, shape, or form. Why did they live longer? Like stronger or like, like smarter? Stronger, smarter, all those kinds of things. So maybe they didn't have computers, mm -hmm. but the, what they could do with the intelligence that God gave them was actually better. And it's, you know, we see that they live longer. We see that they seem healthier and those kinds of things. And so what's interesting is that you think, okay, well, we do see sin starting to spiral out of control quickly, right? Um, but even there, you know, there's, there's some kind of, kind of mercy on people. God always, you know, redeemed and kind of gives a way out. But, but I thought that was kind of an interesting theory. It's well, we not, do know Noah it said lived 600 years. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I don't believe that it, oh, that wasn't a real year or something. No, like no, 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 I think no, it, no. he literally lived 600 years. And I had heard... Um, that okay. Well, it the, takes the, a while to build an ark, right? <laughs> the further away we got from creation, or the the more disease and yeah, other exactly. things. Exactly. The more that in. stuff is sitting there, right. and, and, and then there was a, through a there creation. is a point in the Bible where it says man will no longer live beyond 120 years, which is right in our section here. It, yeah. yeah, is the limit that it says yep. that wasn't mentioned. I don't think in the no, story. No, well, I can't remember. If they I don't, do or not. I don't remember reading it. It's there. Yeah, I don't think it was because I think they skip right to to Noah and his family. They skip that little right. part at the mm -hmm. beginning, chapter six. But uh, um, so here's here's an interesting other question. So we kind of move real quickly from Cain and Abel, flash all the way to Noah. And you miss some kind of cool characters in between. Or you do. Um, so here's the question that came to mind. Yeah. So here, Cain kills his brother. Yes. He is banished. Yep. You got to leave the land. There's yeah. a mark on your forehead. Yep. Good luck. We know that Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve. Mm hmm. And then it says Abel or Cain got married, Correct. found a wife. Had, Cain knew his wife and conceived and bore a son. Either. And had yeah. children. Yep. And you're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. You know, flag on the field here. Who did he hook up with? Like, yeah. who? <laughs> Where's this woman? Where is this from? woman coming from? And yeah, I mean, shortly thereafter, I mean, he talks about, he's, you know, Cain's afraid, right? It even says, oh, you know, I can't bear, you know, he's the I'm going to wander around and people are going to kill me. He's who are these right? people that he's scared of? Exactly. As far as I'm concerned, there's Adam, there's Eve, there used to be a Cain and an Abel. And now there's now just there's the Cain. 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 So in our world, we've only heard about three, three living people. There's only the three Bible. living people. So how do we reconcile this? So this is one of those interesting pieces in terms of how we're going to read the Bible. Um, and so there's a couple of extremes that people have a, you know, do that's kind of problematic with the reading of the Bible. Um, the one that I think we get most nervous about is when people read the Bible and they say, oh, the reason we don't you know, hear exactly where Cain's wife came from or where all these other people came from is because the Bible is just a story. Or, and when they say it's a story, we agree that it's a, a story that we're into, that we're reading about with narrative and characters and those kinds of things. But when they say story, what they really mean is myth. 
Okay, And so they would say that the Bible is just like the Enuma Elish and all these other creation stories that are out there um, from the, the ancient Near Eastern world. And they say, it's just like those. Okay, the, And we would say, no, 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 no. Adam and Eve were real people who lived however many thousands of years ago. I'm not going to sit there and try to figure out the exact number or whatever. But they, they lived at a set time and Eve met a serpent in the garden and it tempted her to eat a fruit and then she gave it to Adam and they both that was the first sin and that is when death entered the world and then Cain and Abel were real sons and then there was a real woman that Cain married and all those kinds of things. So we would say, no, 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 no. it's not just a myth with stories and anything that doesn't make sense just chalk up the fact that it's a mythology and no one really cares. The other extreme that people get into is, okay, well the Bible is a history book. And so it should read just like a history, but then that causes a lot of tension because they're sitting there and trying to figure out, well, why are there these seeming gaps in the history that God is revealing in the Bible? Now, we would agree that the Bible is historical, and we would agree that the Bible is a story. A narrative. A narrative, sorts. but it is not uh, fiction, nor is it meant to read exactly like a history book. So it's not going to give you every detail. It's not going to give you every detail. The point of the Bible is to reveal the narrative history of God and his people. And so he gives us a lot of wonderful stuff, but he only gives us what we need to, to communicate the truths that he needs us to have. And so one of the truths he does not seem to be worried about is, where did Cain's wife come from? Where did these other people come from? Now, are there possibilities that, that jive with the rest of the history that's in the Bible? Sure. You know, and, you know, maybe Cain's wife was another daughter of Adam and Eve, the daughters um, in all these generations. So, I mean, you can sit there and read all these genealogies. They don't mention a whole lot of girls. Sometimes they mention daughters and sometimes they go generations on end without mentioning a single girl. Well, there were obviously women involved. They were mm -hmm. obviously having daughters as well. But that wasn't the point of the narrative because the, the line was passed on through the sons. Okay, And so maybe there were daughters to Adam and Eve as well. Right. That would certainly make sense. And they just aren't highlighted here. All right. There's also some weird... I'm trying to find the reference. Where's the Nephilim and the sons okay, of that, God? Okay, that gets you into chapter 6, right? So, so chapter 3, my spirit shall abide forever. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. That's so verse chapter 4. Three, chapter 6, verse 4. 6, verse 4. Yeah. So you get these weird... You have the Nephilim and the sons of man bearing Okay, went children. to the daughters of men and had children by them. So so this is not in the story, and mm -hmm. probably rightfully <laughs> so. Um, I, I, I know these, Because they don't want to distract. <laughs> I know these references well, because in seminary there were two uh, uh, intramural teams that I couldn't stand. Oh, and one of them was called the Nephilim. For real? The other one was called the Sons of God. Oh, really? The Sons and, of God? Uh, oh, my. Nice. Well, but that's it's a reference here. Yeah, no, as I well. know. Okay, All they were doing. Were um, there mighty men? Were you guys the mighty men? Uh, well, we can get into that later. <laughs> um, long story short, uh, it. it uh, sorry, I just got a text. Oh, our turf got moved. Nice. Is that nice? No, it's stole it, right? They no, they it put the right it spot. close to where it's supposed okay, to go. <laughs> um, anyways, the uh, Nephilim and the Sons of God is just an obscure reference. They're not mentioned really again in the Bible. I think there's one other place where the Nephilim are mentioned. Yes. But nobody really understands it. No. So, so for us to sit here and scratch our head and try to build some big theology about it, you just... You, you can, go, you can read the most good. erudite commentaries with people that have spent their entire lives right. trying to figure these things out. And they in the end, they, they offer They're six guessing. possibilities and they say none of them necessarily is better than the other. Right. So uh, there are some weird references and, and I think it's good. So that's kind of what the story glossed over is is a lot of the genealogy from from Adam to Noah going through Cain and Abel and mm -hmm. their children. And, and, and uh, um, so it, it kind of moves past those real quick uh, just to move on another uh, area that was uh, so a lot of the genealogies um, and here's the point the genealogy is still good stuff so if you want to you know pop on there and see it I mean yeah. it's, it's got interesting things tracing the history of the promise you know you get you know one of the great great grandsons of Cain Lamech who's got an interesting line in there just showing how bad things get right again real quickly I mean he's got a real big boast about you know he'd kill a, a kid for striking him. So if Cain was bad enough that he was jealous right. of his brother, now you know he's got a great great grandson saying, "I'd kill a kid just because they annoyed me." Basically, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> like oh, things do get bad fast. So sin follows the generations. Yeah. Um, so the, the from Noah beyond Noah after the flood, the flood's covered well in the story, but after the flood, that's 
that genealogy, the sons of Noah, kind of um, it skips over that. Um, then how the the nations start to form out of the sons of Noah, mm -hmm. and you start to have as they spread out and populate the earth. That, and you get a it, couple real important lines in there. Okay. So you get the, the Shem, right? right? Yeah. And so Shem mm -hmm. is where the promise is going to come through. That's going to connect us to, to Abram eventually. And you get the sons of Ham. Um, and the most famous son that we recognize is named Canaan, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where the Canaanites and all the people who dwell in the land that eventually God's people are going to come right. into are from. And Ham is kind of the, not the redheaded stepchild, but he's kind of the... He's a Hamite. Yeah, he's... <laughs> I'm sorry, I just think that's funny. Okay. Right. I'm like, is there something I'm missing? No, no. It's just a hammer. He, he's the one that, you know, it's, it's got this weird scene in, after the flood when Noah actually uh, gets drunk. I mean, he's not a perfect person, all right? He may have been a righteous man, but he's mm. not a perfect person. He gets drunk off of wine. He's outside and it actually says that he's naked. Yeah, they say he's so, naked. And so Ham goes up and basically makes fun of his dad. Like, so, oh my goodness, look at dad over there. Ham goes out and he goes, awkward. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except not just like awkward. you know. Um, but he, shame. I mean, it's yeah, a different culture. He's, he's basically yeah. Yeah, shaming his father mm -hmm. in front of the other brothers. And the other brothers are like, what's wrong with you? You know, mm -hmm. this is dad. And they go and cover him up mm -hmm. and say, okay, they, he may have made a mistake. They restore his dignity exactly. while he exploits the shame. Yeah. And, yep. and so that's why the, the Canaanites are kind of, you know, again, sin multiplies. Mm -hmm. So if this is Ham, imagine how much it's going to get worse down the line. So then uh, another one, the big story that's missing is the Tower of Babel. Yeah. And in my opinion, that's the biggest story that's missing out of all of the stories um, because we know it so well it, it connects yeah. to the new testament so strongly um, but all of a sudden eventually all these people kind of come back together to more populous mm -hmm. um, they come together and they decide because they want to be like god i guess is the best way to describe it they build a tower they try to build a big tall tower to, uh, to reach out to heaven um, and we know how it goes. Um, so it's a sign of pride. Right. Um, it's a sign of defying God. You know, one of the interesting things that's pointed out is, you know, you remember at the, the beginning, what does God tell Adam and Eve to do? Be fruitful and multiply and mm -hmm. fill the earth. Yep. Well, after um, the, the flood, now you've got just a few families. So yep. God kind of do delivers the can. Be fruitful, be multiply, and what the earth? Fill the earth. And here, what are these people doing? They're saying, we're going to build a tower so we can stay in what? One spot. Mm -hmm. So they're directly defying God's command to fill the earth. They're saying, no, 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 I don't care what God wants us to do. We're going to do what we want to do, which is really the ultimate sin. We turn in on ourselves and we follow our own will rather than God's commands. So the the result, as you know, the people are scattered mm -hmm. and as they're scattered, so, you know, here's, if we God haven't figured this way. out yet, God's <laughs> going to get his way. So it's very similar to kind of like a Jonah experience. Like, yeah. No, no, no. Try what you will. I'm going to get my way. So he scatters the people. Mm -hmm. As he scatters them, um, he gives them, you know, some things that we can think about it. New cultures, new mm -hmm. language. Um, lots of people even would say new skin colors. Um, so the diversity that we yeah. celebrate now is, yeah. is kind of going to a Tower of Babel. So it's neat to think in those terms, right? Because then when you get to Pentecost in the book of Acts, mm -hmm. and we're not, you know, that's a long ways from where we are now. But if we were to go all the way to Pentecost and fast forward to Pentecost, that is where God kind of puts back together, the Holy Spirit brings back together what was undone mm -hmm. at the Tower of Babel. He brings all people back together centered around Christ mm -hmm. and his mission. So the languages are now no longer broken apart in many Everybody understands each other as one. You have people from all over the world, different nations, different languages, different tribes, different people who are all come together under one umbrella of Christ as well. So diversity can either result in sinful division. Right. Or it can bring together a kind of a multiplicity of talents and peoples and or just the, create a, a mosaic of unity. In the vastness like of how God's grace reaches out yeah. to, uh, across generations, cultures. I always say, you know, uh, to understand how God works, you know, we, we understand God from an American perspective, an American context. Mm -hmm. we, we can't help but understand him. To learn theology in the same Christian faith from those in Africa, when we've had that mm -hmm. opportunity from um, uh, Asia, uh, India is specifically where I've been to hear their understanding of theology. Um, they're confessing this even within the Lutheran church. They confess the same faith, the same mm -hmm. creeds, the same... Um, Christianity, um, but they come at it from a perspective that is so different and foreign from mm -hmm. my perspective. 
Um, we understand everything primarily. So what, how would you describe America? Well, we're, we're very autonomous and independent. Mm -hmm. Um, we celebrate autonomy and independence. Dependency in America is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, we celebrate materialism and, and accomplishments and, uh, ambition more than prosperity more than, than, uh, I think a lot of the world does. Um, where you go to, for instance, I'm going to kind of say maybe a more Asian culture, they're going to celebrate not independence, but dependence um, more than anything. And, and, and when I say dependence, it's more of, it's my responsibility to take care of my mother to put and, and to take care of my grandparents and to take, so you'll find houses of four or five generations. And I and, think one of the beautiful things, you know, dependence sounds like a negative word to us and it. Can have negative it, connotations. It can, but so can independence. Correct. One um, of the one of the phrases I like better is interdependence, maybe because that celebrates that everyone has something to give to each other and everyone right. depends on each other, like a, a circle. Sure. So even the oldest person in the like house. Codependency. Wait a minute. No, no, no. We're not that <laughs> I'm just kidding. But but <laughs> that there's something beautiful about okay, you know, maybe my my you know my great grandparent living with me can't. You know, isn't providing a whole lot financially or physically anymore, but there's a wisdom to be gained from their example or something. Exactly. Like that. Well, so here's an example I've heard from talking to Christians from from India. Okay. Um, and they would say something along the lines of, you know, for us when we think about a 28 year old living at home. Mm -hmm. Sorry for anyone who's 28 living at home. Okay? <laughs> this isn't to dog on you, but when we think about that as as a, an adult, um, so I'll I'll pick my own life. Okay. So if I can think of Catherine living at home at 20, I'm going, oh man, what's going on? <laughs> what's you know, wrong, right? What's wrong? There, there might be something wrong here. I got to I gotta work real hard to get her out of the house and force mm -hmm. her to learn the world. And and, and I do believe that. Okay, so <laughs> Catherine, I, I, am still, I, I am still an American and I understand that. <laughs> but that's not shared in all cultures. Yeah. And, um, and at, at the same way, like, um, let's say if, you know, God forbid my parents ever get to a point where they need care. To, to the thought of, okay, you, you just come live in my spare bedroom. And like, oh, you know, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> sorry, now I've picked on both sides of my world. But, <laughs> Rob, Mary. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, but that's just kind of the way we think. It's, yeah. it's no, every eight, you know, 18 and over should be living alone, should be, have their own house, make their own way. Mm -hmm. Not all cultures celebrate that. Anyways, we're, we're a little bit on a tangent. I don't mean to, to get on that tangent, but it's, it's just kind of interesting how, um, God kind of, he, he has his way of speaking to all cultures and challenging all cultures. Mm -hmm. and, and so do I think America is the best? Well, sure. Absolutely. I'm an American. Why else would I not think that? But, but does that mean I should ignore the challenges sometimes scripture gives? No, I shouldn't ignore it. I, it does give some healthy challenges. That's way off of Genesis. But the Tower of Babel is is really an important uh, story. Just again because of the connection that it has to Pentecost and the yeah, connection so. it gives to the New Testament. Just the storyline of seeing how the world is populated and generated mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, so this is I mean going back to an earlier point you know that we were kind of talking about, which is that the Bible is historical. It's not a history book. It's not a mythology. Right. You know when we go through all these stories. Um, what's kind of a beautiful thing is you can go into the story and, and challenge the people that would you know look at it as myth. Um, oh, you know the Tower of Babel is just a mythology story meant to explain how people got different languages. No, 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 no. It's it's different than a lot of those stories because it's it's grounded in you know kind of historical realities. Yeah, I mean we know at a certain point in time, you know, around when you know this would seem to link up historically, people in the ancient Near East were starting to build these ziggurats, these towers. And what enabled that to happen? Well, the fact that they could make bricks and they could have mortar. And so you see these historical facts that are placed in here. Even the names, this was interesting, I read one time, the names that you find in the Bible, um, so if the Bible was written essentially way later than these th kind mm -hmm. of events would have happened, a lot of these names would have been lost to history. Right. And were they able to go back around and, and look at records of the ancient Near East around Abraham's time and be like, oh, look at these names that Abraham mentions. These are the kinds of names that he would have come in contact with. Right. And yet people will try to say that the story of Abraham was written thousands of years after the Bible says he lived. Well, those names were forgotten to most of the world until archaeology uncovers them well after right. they you know say that the Bible was written. So you know, it's kind of it's kind of cool to be able to go into these stories and say it is not mythology. This is God's history, his story, selective in terms of what he knows what is he the most important to reveal. Yeah, it's to almost us. like a degree of revelatory. I mean, no, he reveals 
He reveals what is necessary mm-hmm. to tell the story of salvation. And and that's what the Bible is. And it, it's all 100% true what he reveals. All right. 100% historic what he reveals. Absolutely. He just doesn't give us... There's sometimes those details that we want to know and we always throw that off as, oh, someday when I go to heaven, I'll ask God so, about it. Right? Like, who, so who was Cain? Or Cain let me was? ask you a question. How many of y'all have sat down and read from cover to cover of the Bible? Oh, yeah. Now, how big would it be if he revealed it all to us? Yeah, no, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Good luck reading that, it. right? We have a challenge reading this one already. Well, it makes me um, think of your sermon on Sunday, you know, the end of John's gospel. And there's these, many more stories right, that, that but, could be written by Jesus. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Isn't that by believing? The you whole may have Bible right. is that Way. Yep, it is. You know, and I know John says that just for John. Correct. But but what he says for John is also true for the whole. Exactly. That was um, my point. Yeah. 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 So then, then the only other thing that's missing is in the genealogy, if you will, from Shem, right, um, all the way to Abram. And that's yep. kind of where it ends. It ends, uh, we're going to pick up in chapter two with the story of Abra- Abram, Abraham. Mm-hmm. And his call. Um, and his call. So um, so that's kind of what's missing. Let me ask you this. Is there anything that struck you as interesting? And, and I'll start with, with one okay, yeah. that, that I found that was interesting. When it was talking about creation in Genesis, mm-hmm. it never dawned on me. But it says that he kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. Mm-hmm. And it says he did it so that they could not mm-hmm. eat from the tree of life. Yeah. And I thought, I, I don't know. And I thought, is that really in the Bible? Well, I, I mean, I knew better, yeah, so yeah. I opened it up, and I, sure enough, it says it right there. I guess I never picked up on that. It's something that mm-hmm. uh, was new to me, and um, and I sat and I pondered, why would he not want them to eat from the tree of life? Is it because... Because here's the thing. We, we understand the tree of life, we would say, is the cross of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and so maybe it's because the story... And this is kind of what I thought of the story, the God's plan of salvation has to carry out. As long as um, so it's not just a story that is to save Adam and Eve, but to save all of mankind, all of creation. And so the story, the tree of life was already there in the garden. The, the plan of salvation in Christ was already there in the garden. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. It's just kind of an odd thing. I don't, okay. I don't know if there's anything to say to it, but... I've always thought of it as, okay, he does not want them to live in imperfection and creation forever. So they have to die. So he says the consequences is okay, so death. And death if you keep eating there. the tree of life, you're going to keep living in this world forever. And I don't want you to live in this broken world forever. Okay. I don't know. That's what I always thought. <laughs> It's more thought than I put into it, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I haven't read it in a commentary, so I guess I hadn't really thought about that one too um, much. But uh, yeah, I hadn't, didn't sit down and do a study on it or nothing. Yeah, I just know. it was just one of those things that got my mind turning, uh, just different. Um, I mean, part of, I guess part of what I'm kind of thinking too is is there's that temptation to go back to something that's not as good. Sure. So Adam and Eve would grab a hold of the comfortable. So the garden was the comfortable. Even if it was broken, even if it's not what God wants for them for, for them forever. And so not only does he kick them out, he puts the angel there. That's that famous angel, yeah. right? The cherubim wielding the, the swirling the flaming sword or whatever. Yeah. Because what would Adam and Eve or the kids do? Eventually they'd keep trying to go back. It's not good anymore. It's not what God wants for you anymore. Right. And yet we it's, would go it's back It's all destroyed. It. It's broken. It's it's. But that's our temptation. We'll right. grab a hold of a broken thing just because it's the comfortable thing. Mm-hmm. And God says, no, I've got something better in store for you even than the garden. Because the garden now is broken. And so, yes, you're going to have to go through a whole lot of pain. I mean, thousands but and thousands. But in the end, it's going to be better. Pain, but it will be better, what right. I have for you. Right. Because, yeah, and that's the cool thing about Revelation. Um, and, you know, I don't want to go all the way to the end, I guess. But, but Revelation, I mean, it shows a new garden. But it's also got the New Jerusalem, the city in it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Garden of Eden was just a garden. It had no city. And so we get to something even better in the end. Okay. Anything else that you saw in there before we kind of dive into a, a little something different? But No, go ahead and okay. go into something no. different. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, what's the big picture? So yeah. we're kind of starting narrow, going broad. So what's the big picture, right? If you could boil this down to, uh, to one... Uh, Story or one phrase of what chapter one is about. What would you? What do you thought? Have a thought? Yeah, I mean, God creates perfect. Man messes it up, and God starts bringing it back. Yeah, I, I think that's the sin prevails uh, for now, but God has a plan, yes. and there's a plan that He is rolling out. So, so what I read in it is that God is still in control. Yes. Man is still is sinful. Man's corruption 
God, he's got a hold of it, though. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't run out of control. It's running rampant through man, but it hadn't run out of control. It's not like God is like, oh, I'm losing it here. No. Um, no. So you can see, and as I read through it, you could really see, uh, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but God's sovereignty um, continuing throughout. Um, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so the word sovereignty, I think, is important. I think sometimes, I, this is an impact, I think, by different worldviews, is that we get into this world and we kind of feel like good and evil are these equally opposing right. forces. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a very um, kind of dualistic, kind of Eastern mythological kind of worldview of things. Where, okay, from the beginning there's been good and evil. And no, 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 God says in the beginning he created what? Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. And in the kind of mythological, dualistic world, well, evil is just as strong as good, and they're just kind of raging back and forth all the time, and, and you never know what's going to come, and they just kind of come some cosmic balance or whatever. And what we see in this story is, no, God starts everything out created good, and every single time evil kind of rears its ugly head, then God already had a response in mind, mm -hmm. and good always triumphs. Um, and I think that's interesting because in our storytelling today, I've noticed in a lot of movies, yeah. you know, they, they like to play around now with, okay, what is good? What is evil? Are they balancing each other? Well, I think they like to play I around noticed. with these and muddy the waters. And the Bible says, uh-uh, it's here's pretty, good. pretty clear. Here's evil. And guess which one's going to win? So good. <laughs> what I find in a lot of shows today is that you find yourself rooting for what you know is evil. Sure. Um, well, like um, Cobra Kai. Did you watch that one? I, I didn't. I you haven't watched that one. I got bored. Yellowstone. Yellowstone. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> uh, uh, an example: Breaking Bad. Sure. How many people yeah. started rooting for the main characters? Yeah, absolutely. Who were drug dealing murderers? <laughs> I mean, so it's like, but you're like, come on, I hope they make it. And you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> don't let the cops um, catch him. Why? Yeah. Yeah, you know? So, so it is a confusion. I yes. agree. But um, you know, the sovereignty of God is real important, and, and you and I talked about this, and, and what I. Looking through it, what, what I'm suspecting and, and uh, is that you're going to find that a lot of this points to the fact that God is sovereign in control. That 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 is a lot of where this that they try to follow a, a storyline. So mm -hmm. God's people then need a ruler. God is always a ruler. Mm -hmm. And they give him a king, and the king is supposed to act in a theocratic way, mm -hmm. taking his um, all of his advice and word from God and, and giving it to the people and. Um, and then eventually all those kings fail and eventually the king mm -hmm. that is Jesus comes and um, and when the king comes he rules as the king is supposed to rule and and ultimately rules through the means of his death and resurrection yeah um, it, it's a I don't want to get into too much of the weeds on this but but it is a there, there's nothing wrong with that. We believe all of that. And it's we believe true. that God is sovereign. But we also don't believe that the center of biblical theology, we would not say, is the sovereignty of God. We do believe that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. But that we would say the center of biblical theology is Christ crucified. So we would look not for the sovereignty of God in every page, though God is sovereign, again. But mm -hmm. we would look for Christ crucified on every page. Correct. And um, that salvation comes not through his rule, but through his death and resurrection. That love is best seen through his sacrifice for us. Absolutely. And and so it's a little nuanced knowing, you know, this comes from, uh, I, I, wanna, I think it comes from Saddleback, uh, Randy Frazee. I think mm -hmm. his background is there. And and they're good, strong, mm -hmm. conservative Christian church. You're not going to read something bad. No, that that's what I'm with. saying. Yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, where would we in this first part see Jesus, I guess, is yeah. where I want to go. The sovereignty of God plays out well, and I think it's intentionally done yeah. that way, I would argue. Um, but where would we see Jesus? In this? So there's beautiful things that, that we're used to, I think. I think we're used to in Genesis 3, noticing right away where God the, predicts the, 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 the sun that will come to the Adam and Eve. That yeah, the separation the and yeah, right? enmity. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But then there's the, the, the cool little note that comes at the end. You know, what's the first thing that God does to care for Adam and Eve? Well, they're naked, and that's causing shame, that's causing separation, and so he <coughs> covers them with the, the skins of animals. It's the first sacrifice. So that reminds me, if you haven't watched the skit guys... Oh, yes, yeah, that's right. We're gonna... The skit guys creation story. Um, so if you, you can either Google skit guys and go They're to... They're comedians, skit... just so you know. Yes, okay. and your children, if they've been to the youth gathering, yeah. would know who they are. 
Um, but you can go Adam and Eve skit guys, and you can find them there. Um, I think Laura is going to put a link for the skit it's guys pretty good. It's for fun. us, and it is a lot of fun to watch. But anyways, that just made me think of that. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you see, you know, God already sacrificing an animal and covering over the sin of Adam and Eve with that skin. And so that's a, a beautiful kind of thing that that prefaces that points forward towards the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, you go, you know, forward, you know, in the, the narrative and you get to, to Noah, you know, and Noah is, you know, saved, right? Um, you know, through the waters, you know, the, you know, the, the flood waters and the New Testament will pick up on that as a kind of a baptismal type of theme that mm-hmm. we're saved through water. But right afterwards, right after Noah um, you know, gets off the ark, what's the first thing that he does? Sacrifices Sacri- some yeah. animals, and that's the first animal sacrifice right. that's done on um, the first time that God instructs them. Why? Because it's going to point us towards Jesus. Right. All right. So. Um, so it's not about God's sovereignty. That's not why we sacrifice animals. It's about oh my goodness. Okay. In fact, God's sovereignty has nothing to do with the sacrifice yeah. of animals. Um, so it's just a. It, again, we believe God is sovereign, but yes. but but it, look carefully as we go through this and find where. Mm-hmm. Um, where Jesus, or what we call typology, uh, yeah. um, is found. Um, so, uh, Christ crucified, we would call the center of our biblical teaching, and that's that's good. God is sovereign as well, and so it's not to miss that or, mm-hmm. or disparage that point either. Um, one one other thought, just let's talk a little bit about creation mm-hmm. and and just the importance of creation and understanding. I'm actually going to preach on this Sunday. Um, one of the points I'm going to make is, you know, Paul says... Um, for you are a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's a very important thing, and I think we miss this. Um, in our world today, creation is challenged. I often tell people to watch Ben Stein's Expelled. It's a movie, mm. um, but it's old. I think I rented it at Blockbusters once. That's how <laughs> oh, man, old it okay. is. So it's not really a movie. It's a documentary more than anything, but it talks about how uh, the conversation of creation is no longer allowed in higher uh, higher, higher education. education. And even in conservative, what we call conserver- conservative uh, universities, like uh, Baylor was mentioned in it, even mm. professors at Baylor, which you know traditionally was a Baptist university, you can't talk about creation. Mm. Um, how it's been expelled from the conversation. Ben Stein is not a Christian, he's, he's Jewish, but he can share in this same frustration argument because they have the same belief that we do about creation, sure. which we believe in a seven day, 24 hour period creation. Mm-hmm. Um, some, we call them uh, creation evolutionists, right? Where they say, oh, God used evolution as a means of creation. Yeah. Um, our Lutheran church and most conservative Christian churches would reject that as well. One of the reasons that creation is so important in our understanding, and it is fundamental to our understanding of salvation. Mm-hmm. If God did not create us Mm -hmm. the first time, he cannot recreate us the second time. That's true. So our salvation, you know, to get out of that Neoplatonic understanding of salvation as this floating to heaven, Mm -hmm. like as an angel or a ghost or just a soul leaving our bodies, which is the junky candy wrapper on the ground, Mm -hmm. right? That's not how we understand it. We believe in a flesh and blood resurrection as Mm -hmm. Jesus was, so will we be. Mm-hmm. Um, and we understand that. And the only way that that is possible is if God can create out of nothing mm-hmm. something. If God can create life out of something that is dead, which, by the way, evolution demands that that had to have happened. And in, in, inanimate had to become animate mm-hmm. at some point. Yeah. But if God had to create something out of nothing, create life out of something where there was no life, that mm-hmm. is the resurrection that we confess. That is the salvation that we confess as a Christian church. And mm-hmm. every Christian church throughout the world confesses that. Um, and if he didn't create us the first time, he's not going to be able to resurrect us mm. from the dead yeah. at the point of our salvation. Creation and new resurrection, creation, yeah. new creation, are... So linked together Absolutely. in our understanding of salvation. And so we just got to be real careful when we, we, if you just flat out deny the understanding of creation, mm-hmm. you really need to check your understanding and theology of what you believe in the resurrection and salvation. Because the two go together. Well, and if you're looking at creation, you're embracing kind of the evolutionistic mindset, that means... 
death is just you know a natural thing that just has to happen for the next generation, for the next generation, for the next generation. Whereas creation tells us, no, death is a bad thing. Is a right. Evolution, of evolution would say death is a necessary thing yes. and something to be celebrated because yep. all that does is make way for the next a generation, better generation. Or yeah, exactly. Um, and and it's it, well, that, that'll give you on a different soapbox. Yeah. but it goes to throw towards a myth of tomorrow is always better than yesterday, and I don't know if that's always true. Sure. Um, but we have a hope in a future right. where God finally says, no more death, no more sin, that I finally can triumph over those things because they're not necessary, they are not good, they are not the plan, but my plan responds to those right. things and makes it's something the world death is your victory. Exactly. And, and, and even to go a step further, because you kind of talk about creation as the beginning, resurrection, salvation at the end. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is the what about the now mm -hmm. Well, but we forget that our salvation is not something, and we've preached on this a bunch, salvation is not just something for the tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It is for the today. Yeah. Um, we believe your salvation begins today. The moment mm -hmm. uh, you receive Christ, have Christ in your, your life, that's the moment where salvation begins for you. That is the moment when you are a new creation. Mm -hmm. And it finds its culmination or finality in the resurrection. Absolutely. Um, but that doesn't take away from the salvation and the new creation you are now. That's that's Romans 6 and how we understand baptism, right? The old is gone, the new is come. Or he says, you, uh, you've died to sin and you're born again. Yeah. Um, so part of the uh, whole idea of being born again is that you have a new life mm -hmm. in Christ. But so even now, we, I think a challenge is to, to deny again the creation account is again to, to deny... The, the new life that we're supposed to live. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess what I'm trying to say is somebody may not see it that way, but they're all connected to each other. Absolutely. Um, and you, it's hard to deny one and, and accept the other. That, then we're missing kind of how the whole story plays out. Um, another thought that I had as we went through this is just all the, the rebuttals that we hear about creation, about... Mm. Um, oh, a, a day was like a thousand years. And mm -hmm. the, the question I always ask is why? Why do we need to say that? Yeah. Um, and, and the answer would be because I've studied books. Mm -hmm. I've read science. Um, and that's where I like that movie, Expelled. It challenges those things. Mm. Um, um, you can, I think you could probably find it. I don't know. I'm sure. Expelled. Ben Stein's Expelled. I, I point people to it all the time. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on some of this? I think a lot of it comes to you know, where where does faith really interact with us when we're going to read the scriptures then? Mm -hmm. So we come at the scriptures and and we come at them. I think you've mentioned it, you know we've mentioned this in these talks before the ministerial or the magisterial use of reason. So ministerial use of reason basically means I'll use my reason, logic, senses, science to come and understand the scriptures as best as possible. And when those fail then I just trust what the scripture right. says. And magisterial says, no, 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 I'm going to come and read the Bible, but wherever it doesn't make sense, and I'm going to move the Bible around to fit what I think my logic says, what I think science says, all those kinds of things. Right. And so when I look at the creation story, a lot of times it goes to, you know, what I notice is, is we go straight to the magisterial use of the reason. Well, that doesn't make sense because of this geological fact that I've read, because of this biological fact that I've seen, because of that. And so rather than saying, well, wait a second, Maybe the facts are still being clarified by science. Maybe the Bible, let's trust the Bible first and what the Bible seems to clearly be indicating and then let science kind of come into that as, as time progresses rather than me try to fit the Bible so, into my science. Science has always been used as a great partner to theology. Sure. Um, and uh, until we got to a more recent in history uh, era where science has become the challenge to It's theology. like the adversary. It's become the adversary, and it didn't mm -hmm. used to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in the history of science, um, theology was always considered a science. Mm -hmm. um, but so they don't need to be adversarial to each other, and they were never intended to be. Um, so most of the science fathers, if you will, that we look at, they lived in a world that God was very much an interactor mm -hmm. with science in their study and their thought. Um, so we do, we believe and confess a seven day creation or six days rest on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. um, 
God's word, as you read through that, God spoke, and God's word is one that is a we call it a performative word. Mm-hmm. Um, if we start to say God needed a thousand years for a day, um, you're just trying to reconcile when we say that kind of two truths that you have been told that really mm-hmm. contradict and oppose each other, um, and you really can't reconcile them. Um, they define what a day is. They say there was evening, there was morning, the, the first, first day, day. second day. Um, it says yeah. that every time. Yep. Um, the other thing is just, could God have built it in six seconds? Uh, if you wanted to, he could have built it in six nanoseconds. Yeah. It's not a matter of God's ability. It's a matter of just how did God do it? Yeah. Um, and how do we understand that in our reading of the scriptures? Um, so he, he did it. He he built the world, created the world, all right? We say, we use the word ex nihilo, this Latin for out of nothing, mm-hmm. meaning in the beginning was just simply God. Yeah. And then he started to create. And what did he use to create? He created, he used his word. He simply spoke life into existence. And again, even that becomes an incredibly important part because what do we believe um, is the power behind uh, the salvation is this the spoken word. word of God's grace. Um, in baptism, we speak the words of uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In proclamation, we speak the words of grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ for you. So we believe words create reality. We Words create reality when it comes to God. So salvation comes to you through a spoken word. Creation in the beginning comes to you through a spoken word, right? And there's... There's not a distinction between how God understands how he created the world and then how he recreates it in salvation. It's the same act for him. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it's important that we, we uh, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you're going, ah, I don't know. I'm going to tell you that's why I love that creation museum you mentioned in Kentucky. I've never been there. I want to go. Mm-hmm. We made it to Kentucky. We were that was as far as we can get. <laughs> we went to a Mammoth Cave National Park, and that was like another three hours. I was like, oh, but we did another three hours to get here. Anyways, long story short, I, I want it's one of the places I really want to go. Um, there, there is science again. There is ed- incredibly educated, incredibly brilliant minds that still believe in creation and will mm-hmm. use science and dating and all of that to support that. Um, so I would just encourage y'all to, to to read from both sides of that story because there are, there are uh, or for, of that study because there there is another side. Part of what Ben Stein's show is about is the other side is not given a voice mm-hmm. and and to the point where they've been fired and thrown out of higher education systems for speaking that voice. Yeah. All right, there's a little bit of a rant, but any any thoughts or any other deep theologies you want to get into i'm just my encouragement is you know keep reading um that that's part of the beauty of this experience is to listen to god's word we just talked about god's word is formative that it creates reality and so the more time we spend in this story right now right the more god can work on your life and the more you're going to make connections between adam and eve who seem like these ancient figures and your very real life right now the more you're going to connect cain and abel's story to your experience the more you're going to connect noah's experience to yours you know noah living in a a generation that seems like no one agreed with him you know no one followed god everything's going to hell in a handbasket you know kind of literally or whatever like well what does it look like to live as the faithful person in that generation man there's a lot of stuff that god can speak into our lives and can encourage us in terms of what it looks like to to live just listening to him and his word and his guidance thank you all um i appreciate uh bearing with us you know it was about an hour um I hope guess, you enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I really do. And, and like I said, we, we wanted it to be more than just a 10-minute. We had a little bit of introduction. We won't give so much of the introduction next time. We'll just kind of dive into the Scripture. There's some good stuff with Abraham. And um, If you have any questions about next sections going on, you're kind of looking ahead, ask, you could always send those things in advance absolutely. too, and we'll jump into it. We'll cover it. So blessings to you. Thank you very much.